So let's get started. So this is a, a new thing, I think. We started it last year, and uh, this year um, we're going to try it again. Um, I'm not Brooks Hansen. <laughs> uh, he asked me to do this for him. And my name is Lisa Tokes. I'm the chair of the Publications Committee. So uh, we're going to have the greatest hits from uh, various journals. And we're going to start with uh, Steve Hauck, who's going to tell us about um, the most exciting papers published in JGR Planets. So let me. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about some things that uh, were pretty exciting in planetary science over the last year, and also some things coming up that are going to be uh, rather interesting. Um, I'm actually going to talk about things that are mostly actually not in JGR planets, <laughs> um, but there are a few things here. Uh, so I took a little bit bigger view of what was happening um, in the literature. So one of the really important sort of results um, in planetary science uh, this year came out of the Juno mission. And so the Juno mission is a mission to Jupiter. Uh, and its goal is to really study the deep interior of the planet. And it does this by being a, an orbiter that dives really close, but it does it in an orbital, in a polar path, which lets it get in, not be inside the radiation belts of Juno very often. Um, let's us get these beautiful views of the pole of Jupiter, which we really hadn't had before. And we can see um, vortices and storms that happen near the poles. Um, but the, some of the really big results that came out of Juno in the past year have to do by using the gravity field of Jupiter um, to infer how deep the winds that make the bands that we see um, how deep do those extend into the interior? Um, and, they f and so there was a debate for a long time about whether those bands and that's, those storm systems were really shallow, very near the surface, or whether they extended very, very deep into the interior. Um, Juno's result was it's in between the two. Um, and they found that it's about 3,000 kilometers depth. Um, at the same time, uh, the Cassini spacecraft was doing uh, orbits of Saturn in a similar sort of framework. And it turns out that they found that there, the winds extend down to about 10,000 kilometers uh, beneath the, the cloud tops. There, of course, uh, it's a smaller planet. And so uh, the pressures don't reach uh, the same until you get to deeper in the planet. But what's really interesting is that for both of these planets, they have found that at about a conductivity of about one semen per meter is where the winds are no longer uh, extending. And so now they're going with the rotation of the planet, which um, is an indication that the Lorentz forces from the magnetic field are starting to break the winds. And so this tells us about what's happening in the deep interior and what's um, happening in how the magnetic field is generated and how that interacts with the winds and things that we see at the surface. Um, something else that uh, Cassini was doing while it was diving close to the planet is um, it started to get a really good view of what is the interaction of the rings that we see with the uh, atmosphere. And so one of the things that they found was they were able to determine essentially the rate of that mass is falling from the innermost rings onto uh, Saturn. And by measuring that, they were able to get an estimate of how old um, the rings are. And so the rings are about 100 million years old. Um, for a while, people thought they might have been older. So this was a result that was interesting by itself. Um, but they're also finding things that, you know, it's not just water that's being dominated. And those are the large things that uh, make up the rings. Um, instead, I mean, there's a large amount of hydrogen and helium that's raining onto 
planet. But it is also finding that about 37% of what's falling is actually organics. And they're also finding significant amounts of methane and other gases. And so this is changing what they're finding in the ionosphere of Saturn, as well as what the compositions of the atmosphere is over time. So shifting gears and talking about one thing that was in JGR planets. Uh, so there was, over the last year, there has been uh, new work suggesting that there is a new type of uh, planetary structure, something that the authors, so um, Simon Locke, who was a PhD student uh, working with Sarah Stewart, and they were looking at situations where a large impactor, something say the size of Mars hitting the Earth, when there's a lot of angular momentum. And what happens in the aftermath of that large impact, which would be the sort of thing that would create the Earth's moon. And what they found is that there, it creates this massive structure where a huge amount of the silicate material, the rock material, is vaporized into a, a very large extended atmosphere. And so that's what's shown here in this artist conception and then also over on the right, which shows that all of that yellow stuff there is an atmosphere that extends well beyond the orbit of the moon. And it creates this sort of donut structure, which for some reason they decide to call a synestia. Um, what's interesting here is this creates an entire atmosphere that has the composition of the bulk silicate Earth. And so one of the things that we've been trying to understand for many years is the very clear, um, almost identical compositions between the moon and the Earth's mantle. And how do you do that when you're mixing different bodies coming together? Here, the idea is that it all started from the same gas and that the moon condensed out of that um, and the moon was essentially formed when that gas structure essentially cooled enough back onto the earth that it was left behind. And that's what you see in the, the lower right there. And so this is reinvigorating the sort of um, thinking about trying to understand what the origin of the moon and how it's linked to the origin of the earth and understanding the composition differences and the dynamic differences of how planets are formed. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and start looking forward a little bit. There've been things that have been happening that have implications um, for the next year or so. So one of the things that's exceptionally exciting is that over the last uh, six months, um, two spacecraft have uh, arrived at two different asteroids, two very primitive asteroids, chondritic asteroids, we think. Uh, so Hayabusa 2 from the Japanese Space Agency and OSIRIS-REx from NASA and on the left, you can see Ryugu, which is where Hayabusa 2 is. Um, it landed three little rovers. They're basically boxes that bounced around and got very close up views of the planet. Um, and eventually what they're going to do on both of these is their spacecraft are gonna come very down close and then they're going to take a sample and then they're going to return it to the Earth for study. So we have samples that we think are like these bodies, but we don't know their provenance. We don't know how they vary. So we can see even in this new image from OSIRIS-REx that there are big differences in the color. And they announced at this meeting that they're also seeing uh, water and organic absorption bands. So they may be starting to see things that will be exceptionally primitive to tell us about things that happened um, in the earliest days of the solar system. And then last, there are a few things that are upcoming pretty soon. Um, so. Um, on New Year's, New Year's Day, uh, New Horizons, which was the spacecraft that flew by Pluto and the Pluto system, it's actually going to make a flyby of a Kuiper Belt object, um, which has been named Ultima Thule. Um, and so this will be the most distant object that we'll, we will have studied. It's going to fly by at about 3,000 to 3,500 kilometers, so it's somewhat of a distant uh, flyby. Um, but this, these are objects that date from the earliest stages of the solar system and will be able to give us a sense of, you know, how are these objects, how are they evolving over solar system history and what are they made of in understanding how the solar system was formed. Uh, last week, um, the Chinese Space Agency launched a rocket with a spacecraft to go to the moon. Um, it's going to have a lander called Chang'e 4. 
and it is expected that that spacecraft is going to land on the far side of the moon um, in the South Pole Aiken Basin. South Pole Aiken is the largest impact structure um, on the moon and is an area that tells us about its earliest history and also maybe a place where we can start to understand even more about the interior of uh, the moon. And so it's expected the Chinese Space Agency hasn't suggested a, an exact landing date, but the, the understanding is that it, it may be sometime in the, very early in the new year that they may do the landing of this. And then there were some other recent events you may have heard of. Um, NASA landed the InSight spacecraft on Mars. This spacecraft is going to be placing its seismometer on the ground, and it also has a self, as a drill that's going to drill down uh, five meters um, itself, and it's going to use that to measure the heat flow um, on the planet. And so this will be the first time that we will have had um, seismic data that are not just about the wind. Um, Viking had a uh, seismometer that was up on the deck and just measured the vibration of the spacecraft. Um, this will be placed on the ground and will be able to tell us about the seismicity, the interior structure um, of Mars. And then last but certainly not least, um, the Europeans and the Japanese have launched the Bepi Colombo, Colombo mission to Mercury. It launched in November um, and it's starting its seven-year cruise on its way to orbit the planet and it's a two spacecraft mission which will be studying both the magnetosphere and the interior and surface of Mercury and is will be a great follow-up on the messenger mission um, that was from NASA that orbited from 2011 to 2015. Thank you. Uh, well, let's have one question. Or, or is, does anybody have a question? Can I, co I mean, comment how? <laughs> so I think it, it's prime. So, so the the question is about. So this lock model is it, it's a variation on the the concept of a giant impact being the 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 canonical way of forming the Earth's moon. And so I think this is really what it is. Is it's it's a it's a variation on that concept, and I think it it. Its primary primary purpose was to try to be able to do a better job of explaining the geochemical similarities between the Earth and the Moon that the canonical impact model was unable to ex explain. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So moving on, uh, our next editor is uh, Dina Payton, who's from Oceans. We don't actually have a journal called Oceans. I'm yeah. an editor in G-Cubed. G G but ocean topics related to the oceans are covered by several journals in a, that AGU journals. And I will give a flavor of various papers in different journals, as well as a few papers that are have been published in Science and Nature. They would have been published in AGU had they not been published there. OK. so. Oceans, the major issue that raised to the top in terms of uh, concerns, people's interests, lots of the community interests, uh, ranges about changes in the ocean, environmental changes in the oceans and their implications, particularly what we call ocean warming or marine heat waves. Like we have land heat waves, there's marine heat waves. As you can see on the, in the figure over there, this is from a recent paper, as a review paper about uh, ocean warming, and it compares, for example, here the changes in temperature on decadal in different de decades between 1930s and the 2000s, and you can see very clearly this is real measured data how a uh, large of a warming effect we have. This is from one site in Antarctica, but that's being measured all over the place. And that has a relative, a, a wide range of other implications, including ice melting, ice calving, sea level rise, hurricanes, uh, which bring flooding to the land, 
reef bleaching that is related to ocean warming and changes in ocean circulation. I'm going to show just one or two examples from each of these impacts. So in terms of the ocean warming, there's ocean hotspots. Certain areas in the ocean are warming much more rapidly compared to the rest of the ocean. These areas are already experiencing a lot of change. You can see them here in the map. They're all over the place. And this has consequences to species habitat range because different organisms are adapted to certain temperature ranges. It causes changes in ecosystems like harmful algal blooms, changes in ocean productivity with implications for fisheries and therefore for uh, people that have all their lives uh, counted on being able to fish for their living. And then there's a whole series of paper about, so what do we do? So adaptation and best management practices to address these issues that are probably unavoidable at this stage. Even if we stop adding fossil fuel to the atmosphere, the oceans are still going to absorb some heat. And this is an example of how this new terminology of marine hotspots is defined, just like we have different um, categories of hurricanes. We now have different categories of hotspots. This is defined by a, each bracket is a degree above the average annual temperature that persists for certain duration. And you can see examples in the last, uh, you know, in the two, since 99, different events where you can see that the IMAX is the temperature above, how many degrees above the average the heating was and for the, the duration in day, days and then there's the definition whether it's a category, moderate or a strong or a severe or extreme heat event. So what happens when you heat the atmosphere and you heat the ocean? One of the things that happened is ice melts. Um, I don't, I'm not connected to the internet, but the thing that is in uh, golden there, if you Google that, it's an amazing video that was captured by uh, people who were doing observations in the, in, the, in the Jacobson Glacier in Greenland or other, no, actually in the Heilman Glacier in Greenland, and they actually capture this huge calving of an ice uh, of ice and were able to quantify it and and map it and see it and it's really loud and moving so it's an amazing thing to look at and gives you appreciation for what this climate change is doing so if there's anybody that you know that denies climate change this is a wonderful thing to show them um, it's 90 seconds and it's really amazing. There's also a lot of satellite images of other glacials that have uh, been calving now. The glacials or these icebergs themselves are not directly contributing to sea level rise because they're already in the ocean, but they're kind of stopping the land-based glacials from getting in the ocean. So once they're gone, the glacials that are on land move much rapidly and that contributes to sea level rise. And you can see here, there's a whole series of uh, papers related to sea level rise, hurricanes and flooding, with a lot of modeling that looks at what will happen to the same level of hurricanes with the same um, wind speed if the sea surface temperature is one degree or two degrees higher, how much flooding will that uh, result, or how much higher flooding will that induce? And on average, if you do these calculations for the areas that are prone to be hit by hurricanes, if now in a severe hurricane you get eight meters of waves ramping onto land with these models for a scenarios of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius increase, you will almost double that. So that is really has a lot of implications 
to people who are living around the coastline, then there's 100 million people that live within one meter of the ocean. So that's, they're definitely be uh, covered by waves, as, as you can see in that, uh, from, last, from 2017 in Houston, that's the picture up there. Um, other things that are the heat is doing is it's changing the density of the ocean and therefore circulation and both the um, uh, and Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which controls the movement of the Gulf Stream up north and warms north in Europe. If that's going to slow down, there might be implications to heat transport in the ocean, changes in ocean sh circulation with severe implications to what's happening on the continents, as well as uh, changes and, part and specifically almost termination or, s or shutdown of El Nino events. And El Nino events have, again, consequences to people living on land in terms of precipitation and a lot of other effects. So these are um, results that have been models, models, modeling results about how ocean circulation will change with these temperature increases. So the temperature also has, uh, temperature increases also have implications to living organisms. There's a lot of papers about coral bleaching and ocean acidification, and the bleaching just basically kills corals. These are events that occur and have occurred in the past, but now they occur more frequently and to longer duration, such that the recovery from them is much slower and less successful. In the map, they're all the red dots are places where there is a more than 50% reduction in the life, life, uh, living corals. You can see the north of uh, Australia there is hit very badly. So again, that has implications to people that depend on the coral reef, as well as the reef's function in being a barrier between for storms and protecting the land. To counter that, there's also interest about blue carbon sequestration. Uh, there's a lot of potential for natural sequestration of carbon in wetlands, in seagrass beds, and uh, mangrove systems. So there's a suite of papers that talk about how much carbon is sequestered in the systems, what are the governing processes, how does sea level rise and tidal going to impact the or change the carbon sequestration? Is there anything we can do in terms of restoration of these ecosystems? Uh, how do we monitor these carbon uptake so we can actually use that for carbon markets, so in the cap and trade, um, so econ papers in economy, and what are the implications, again, as a feedback, a negative feedback for climate change. Um, Another really big and very popular topic is the plastics in the ocean. I'm sure everybody heard that there's lots of plastic in the ocean. Actually, if you went to any of the uh, bright star sessions, all the high school kids that presented work here, half of the presentations were on plastic because it's something that is really capturing the broader population and uh, the general public. And in addition to like big chunks of plastic bottles and a lot of nets from fishing that you can see f visually on the left side over there, the focus these recent years is on microplastics, things that we cannot see, but that penetrate the food webs, and you can see the, the plastic pieces in the guts of the fish that we eat. We found, they were found in blood cells of marine organisms, and in the EOS recently, there was the first detection of microplastics in human feces too. So we're eating this, it goes into our system. Not very good news. So the, the focus is about what are the sources of this plastic, their distribution, processes that enable their degradation because different plastic types can degrade at different rates under different conditions. Do they sink efficiently? What is their impact on the carbon, the biological carbon pump? I'm sinking to depth. 
do they bioaccumulate, and impacts on organisms. So lots of uh, papers about microplastics. There was, I found this uh, very interesting. There was the Volvo Ocean Race, which is a sailboat race. They equipped the sailboats with a simple sampling devices that they could actually measure the number of plastic particles in a liter of water all along the pathway. They also measured carbon, uh, CO2 in the water continuously. And as you can see, the, reds, the, the lines show their sailing path and the numbers show the numbers of microplastic particles in a meter cube of water. You can see numbers of 200, 300 particles in a cubic meter of water. And it's very interesting, you know, it's easy to understand why we have more close to the continents, but sometimes the, it doesn't really, uh, the, the, the understanding of the currents do not explain why this distribution is the way we see it. For example, way out in Point Nemo, they found plastics, but certain place in the North Atlantic, that sample did not contain any plastic particles. These are the white, the three white spots. So uh, out of 75 samples that were collected, only three did not contain microplastics. So it's not, again, it's very broadly distributed everywhere in the ocean. Uh, another area, I'm almost done, is deep sea mining with the development or use of uh, lots of rare earth elements and metals like cobalt, nickel, copper for batteries and for uh, other electronic instruments where the community is looking for other sources of mining and there are these nodules in the bottom of the ocean that are enriched with lots of rare metals and uh, there is a lot of processing or scoping on a lot of also negotiations of who can mine this, how do we mine this, and so on, on one hand. And there is a very, one of the, oh, the geotracers cruises that went out of Oregon in, uh, on the clip, um, where is that? Uh, Claron Clipper Clipper Tron Zone. That's off Oregon. No. Yeah. That's, zone. that's on the fractures. That's not off Oregon. That's south of Oregon. No. I think so. It's a little bit south of Oregon. Uh, anyways, they while they were sailing over there, they saw lots and lots of these about 26 or so boats that were scoping the area. They were all mining boats. Now that has implications to sea-dwelling organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean, like this ghosty octopus up there. They actually laid their eggs on the manganese nodules, and they kind of protect them there. They nest on these nodules. There's a lot of other organisms that, that that's their habitat. The other thing is the noise of all of this mining that is going to impact navigation of mammals and pollution because they're not, the plans are not to bring all of this sediment back to land, but to at least sieve and process it in the ocean and dump the, the leftovers back into the ocean, which will have a lot of negative implications. So that's another area of study. These are, oops, sorry, these are some of the papers that I mentioned. Um, there's also a lot of interest in new technology, both in terms of new sensors, autonomous vehicles, robots, and communications, because we realize that on cruises, on boats, we can't really cover the ocean efficiently and effectively, and sending these unmanned vehicles and sensors, we can do a lot more uh, and even sample, there's even sensors that can go underneath icebergs and collect data there, which is actually almost impossible from the surface. Um, finally, I've got a couple of things that are still oceanography. This is paleoceanography and paleoclimatology. Uh, this is the first year, 2018, that the journal changed its name from paleoceanography to paleoclimate, paleoceanography and paleoclimatology, reflecting the 
a consensus in the community that it should encompass both areas. And it's also uh, the first year that there's a new section at AGU that is called Paleo Paleo. It was previously a focus group within oceanography. So we have a new section there. Um, this is one highlighted uh, project where for the first time they did an ecosystem model for paleo conditions. So models are hard enough for ecosystem models are hard enough to depict in the present. And this is a whole array of environmental sensor uh, and input from a lake area that was all used together to reconstruct the ecosystem in that lake and how it changed over time through the last glacial. Another th thing that is really cool is a new ice core that was drilled in the Taylor Glacier. So usually you drill a, an ice core downwards. This was a horizontal ice core at the area where the glacial kind of flows towards the land and then the bottom part of it becomes closer to the surface and you can actually date these uh, glacials and get a much easier way to sample old ice. And the nice thing about the specific studies, they were able to actually solve a very problematic issue that we had in the oceanographic community where different ice cores from Antarctica had or showed different climate change. They were decoupled in terms of timing of when CO2 um, changed. And with that new glacial record, a new chron they managed to adjust the chronology of Taylor Dome. And now it looks like Antarctica is all behaving more synchronously and not half of it doing one thing and another half looking like the northern hemisphere. Um, finally, there's also a few papers which I don't know much about, but there's all potentially oceans in other planets and there were, I, there's several papers about volatile content on other planets. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Adina. I was wondering about the, uh, the plastics in the oceans. Anything known about how damaging it really is? Well, we know that it's. We know for sure that it's damaging organisms because we know that some of these um, plastics ex kind of release various compounds that interfere with hormonal systems. So this is one area. There's lots of entangling of wildlife in plastics. That's why they tell you to cut the little loops from your soda cans. But actually, the most uh, entangled animals is in fishing nets. You know, the nets break, they throw them in the ocean, and animals get caught in that. I actually personally saw something like that two years ago when I did some work in the Bering Sea in, in Alaska, that area, and there were like three beluga whales, and they were completely stuck in discarded fishing nets, and it was really sad because there was nothing that could be done to help them. Mm -hmm. The stories you, you tell, I'm, I'm sure it happens, um, but I was just wondering how people... Not in terms of, as far as I know, not in terms of global impacts on global ecosystems or carbon cycle, but rather local communities. There are global estimates on how much plastic is out there, but, not, but less so on the impacts in terms of the global picture. Thank you, Adina. Good luck getting your flight. OK, the next uh, talk will be from Tectonics, and it will be given by uh, Taylor Schildgen. Is John Geisman here, too? No. OK. Yeah, so John apologizes for not being able to make it. He had to go catch a flight. Um, but I do want to acknowledge him because he helped to put together this presentation that I'll be giving. Okay, um, so, so um, I'll be talking about what's exciting in tectonics in the past year, in 2018. And I want to start off by talking about earthquakes. 
Um, so predicting earthquakes is really the holy grail of the field of seismology. Um, and unfortunately, we're still very far from being able to predict earthquakes. However, we have made some substantial improvements this year in being able to predict the location of aftershocks that follow major earthquakes. And in some cases, these can be quite devastating on their own. And I'll just give you a quick example from the 2015 Gurkha earthquake in Nepal. Um, so the main shock associated with this earthquake had a magnitude of 7.8. It's located here in red. Um, this resulted in 9,000 people killed, 22,000 injured. Um, the biggest aftershock had a magnitude of 7.3. It's shown here in blue. It occurred a couple weeks later. And this killed an additional 200 people and left more than 2,500 people injured. Okay, so this year in science, DeVries et al. used a machine learning approach that was trained on more than 130,000 main shock aftershock pairs to try to better predict the location of aftershocks. And then they evaluated their results using an additional 30,000 main shock aftershock pairs. So this upper row is showing the results of this machine learning approach. So what you see in the red color is their predicted locations of the aftershocks for a few different big earthquakes. And in black are the actual locations of the aftershocks. Okay, so it's not too bad, but you can see compared to the previous estimates, based on a Coulomb failure stress change model, it's actually a huge improvement. Okay, next we have some good news from Antarctica. Um, and this comes um, as a result of some work published in Science by Berletta et al. They're working on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet in the Amundsen Sea embayment. This is an area of quite rapid ice loss, as you can see in this figure over on the right. Um, but actually, one of the most challenging things to do in calculating ice loss is to correct for how much the crust itself is rebounding upwards isostatically as a result of the loss of that load. Okay, this is something that we call the glacial isostatic adjustment. Um, so as part of their study, they wanted to better constrain this GIA. So to do that, they set out a series of GPS stations. And those GPS stations recorded some extremely high uplift rates. Um, in the most extreme case, 41 millimeters per year of uplift. Now, the only way to explain this really rapid uplift is with a very low mantle viscosity. Right? So the mantle is flowing back underneath that crust to push it upwards. Um, specifically with, with a value of around 10 to the 18th Pascal seconds. And that's actually two to three orders of magnitude lower than common estimates of the mantle viscosity. It actually has two implications. Um, first of all, it means that this glacial isostatic response is much faster in this location um, than we've previously appreciated. And the good news comes from the fact that this actually has a stabilizing influence on the ice sheet. Right? Because the crust is rebounding and lifting the ice sheet upwards, it actually lifts it partly out of the water, which can help to prevent catastrophic collapse of the ice sheet. Okay, um, so there are other locations in the world where there are also new findings of very rapid uplift. Um, and one was in south central Turkey in a place called the Toride Mountains. And in this case, the cause of the, uh, sorry, the rate of uplift was constrained with a very different approach. It's based on dating marine sediments that have been lifted up above sea level. Um, so Eretman et al. and Tectonics um, dated marine sediments that are currently at elevations between one and 1.5 kilometers above sea level. Um, and they found middle Pleistocene ages, which means about 500,000 years old. So this implies a long-term uplift rate of three millimeters per year, which is a whole lot lower than those rates in Antarctica, but it's actually still very fast relative to many active mountain belts around the world. And this is actually hard to explain because in this location, there's no apparent crustal shortening and thickening like we expect in active mountain belts. Right? So what they suggested instead is that this rapid uplift is also a result of an isostatic response to the removal of a load. But in this case, we're not removing a load from the top, such as through melting ice. Instead, we're removing a load that's actually pulling the crust down from below. Right? And that load in this location is suggested to be um, a subducting oceanic plate beneath beneath the torides. And there was actually some very nice corroborating evidence for that hypothesis published in Geosphere by Portner et al. And what we're looking at here is something that's a result of a technique called seismic timography. It allows us to image the, ge uh, the geometries of, of slabs that are subducting beneath the surface. So to get you oriented, um, here's Turkey. Notice this is the north arrow. So we're looking towards the southwest. And below this map, is the geometry of these downgoing slabs. Right? Those are these blue blobs. And notice that this particular slab, which is subducting beneath southern Turkey, has a large tear within it. Right? So this is suggested to explain this isostatic response and rapid uplift in southern Turkey. <laughs> 
Okay, one final example of how mantle flow and mantle processes may be ex affecting um, deformation at the Earth's surface is coming from the Tibetan Plateau and actually all of Southeast Asia. Um, so the Tibetan Plateau itself is the largest orogenic plateau on Earth. It extends for thousands of kilometers in both north to south and east-west directions. And it primarily results from the collision of India with Eurasia. Now the strange thing about the Tibetan Plateau is that in a classic tape plate tectonic framework, we expect the deformation to be focused along the plate boundaries. But in this case, that deformation is extending well into the Eurasian plate. Um, this, this whole area is a bit more odd if we look at even a broader scale of all of Southeast Asia. And what you could see here is that the whole region colored in white is also undergoing this distributed deformation. But in this case, it's more strike slip and extensional deformation. Again, very hard to explain with a classic plate tectonic framework. Um, so Jolie also suggested in tectonics this year um, that mantle flow driven by large convection cells can help to explain this distributed deformation. And specifically what they suggested is that large convection cells, um, which are illustrated with these black arrows, um, initially helped to drive India northwards and also helped to subduct a large oceanic plate that initially existed between India and Eurasia. But as soon as India collided, this caused a change in the upper mantle flow patterns, which are shown in these white arrows, and that actually helped to facilitate the extension of all of Southeast Asia. Okay, and I just have one final topic to cover very briefly. Um, and that's we've actually gained some good insights into the composition of the lower mantle as a result of diamonds that have been brought up in kimberlite pipes. Um, this is a paper that was published in Nature by Nestola et al. And um, within inclusions in these diamonds, um, they found something called the perovskite structured polymorph of calcium silicate. Right, so what is that? Um, it's actually theorized to be the fourth most abundant mineral in the Earth system, but it was never before discovered. All right, so that was quite exciting. Um, and other inclusions within the diamond and also the diamond composition suggest that it's actually coming from basaltic oceanic crust that was subducted all the way down into the lower mantle. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thank you, time for one question. No questions? Thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry, I'm blind. Okay. Can you tell a bit more about this perovskite? I have no background in this field. You say it's supposed to be the fourth most abundant. Yeah. So. But apparently, we haven't found it yet. We haven't found it because it's 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 supposed to be mostly within the lower mantle, and we get very little material coming up from the lower mantle. Um, it's theorized to be there based on um, what we see about things like how seismic waves pass through um, the Earth, right? So based on the speeds, um, um, this is actually suspected to be a very common mineral, but we just haven't had material come up from those depths very, very until now, yeah. So you, let's say, confirming that it actually is there, how, how would that help us? That's, I, I don't think it's a silly question. Um, there, there actually still are some uncertainties in, in the overall um, mineralogical composition of the Earth, right? And, and this is actually quite important to interpreting seismic wave speeds, right? So if we, if we have very good understanding of that, we can actually better interpret that, which helps with things like, for example, those seismic tomography images are based on things like um, modeling how seismic waves are, are passing through the Earth. So. Okay, next up we have Julianne Struve, uh, GRL editor, and she's going to talk about the Arctic. So yeah, do I just change it here? Yeah. Okay. There you go. And Great. You can, you can look at this. Okay, well, we already skipped to my, my second slide, which is okay. Which is okay. Um, oh, we can go back. No, it's okay. Oh. It's just my introductory slide, so. So, what, but anyways, in my, in my um, brief um, highlights, I kind of want to just focus on different aspects of the Arctic. So, um, looking at the oceans, looking a little bit at the atmosphere, um, the land, and the ice sheets. <clears throat> Excuse me, I do have a cold, so. Um, but I thought I would start with the Arctic report card, because every year NOAA releases their Arctic report card. And they always tend to release it during AGU. So this year it was announced in, uh, on Tuesday. And what it does is it tries to summarize our current state of um, what happened in 2018, basically, in the Arctic. 
And one of the things that I'm just going to focus on just from that report card is the temperature. So they looked at annual temperatures um, for the Arctic, so October through September. And as we know, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet, and this is true. Um, these warming temperatures are continuing even in 2018. And in fact, 2018 ranked as the second warmest um, year since um, at least the 1900s. And the past five years, in particular, exceed all previous records in temperatures. Now, of course, this is an annual um, air temperature average, so it does hide a lot of variability from month to month. So the winter was quite warm, for example, and we did have record low sea ice during winter. But then in summer, things were not a little bit mixed. So in June, we had kind of a warm month, but then July was quite cold. And even though we thought maybe early on in the summer we might approach record low sea ice conditions or enhanced Greenland melting, July was actually quite cool and it really slowed a lot of the ice loss um, and, and melting over Greenland as well. And August then was quite warm and it actually was warmer than July, which is quite unusual. I think it's only the second time that's happened in the last 50 years where the month of August was actually warmer than the month of July. But anyways, we're still continuing on the track of a much warmer Arctic, and of course that has a lot of implications for the various components of the Arctic system. So the first paper I just wanted to highlight, and this just came out about three weeks ago, but it's sort of confirming what we already know in that the melting in Greenland in the last several years, the last couple decades, is very unusual compared to what it used to be. And what this study did is it actually looked at different ice cores, and these were mostly around Western Greenland, and, for example, they had two different ice cores here where they're looking at stratigraphy in the ice cores and relating it to surface melt through also satellite observations. And they find that there's a strong correlation, for example, between these two different ice cores that were about 40 kilometers apart. Um, so by looking at these spatial variabilities in these different ice cores, this is a different ice core that's actually in the melt season. But basically, you can see for um, these are two different cores. This is one core and this is another core. This one goes back further in time. You can see that the melting that's been happening in the last few years was quite unusual for this long-term um, record. And this is just showing you the mean from 1994 to 2013 for each of the different um, cores. And this is a, a core that's in a lower elevation, so it actually has a lot more summer melt, so it does have higher values. But again, what's been happening in the last several years is quite unusual. And they could go back to about 350 years um, with these different cores and basically show that today's melt is really unprecedented in at least 350 years. And that confirms a lot of other studies that have come out over the last several years, even using longer cores. But I think what was unique about this study was that because they looked at several cores, they were able to try to extend this to cover the entire ice sheet rather than specific locations um, from certain cores. The other thing that came out, there was a lot of studies that came out this year talking about Atlantification of the Arctic Ocean. And I'm just pulled out three. Um, there was one in JGR Oceans. There was two in Nature Climate Change. And the figure that I'm showing is just an example from the Barton et al. paper. This is just showing sea surface temperatures in the Barents Sea. And this is looking at sea surface temperature trends. This is 1985 to 2004 and 2005 to 2016. And so what these studies have been showing is, yes, the sea surface temperatures in the Barents Sea sector are warming. But what's interesting is what's driving this. So the, the Renard all paper really focused on the area near Svalbard, and these other two really focused in the Barents Sea sector. But typically, we know that there's been this increased flux of warm Atlantic water coming into the Arctic and entering the Barents Sea, for example. But typically, that warm water, that warm, salty Atlantic water, is separated from the colder, fresher Arctic water that's on top. But because we've been having less summer sea ice, particularly in the northern Barents Sea, we're having less export of fresh water that then sits on top of that um, um, denser, saltier Atlantic water. And so what we're getting is we're starting to see more mixing of, Atl of, of the Atlantic water into those Arctic waters in the Barents Sea sector. And this is important because basically now you're changing that part of the Arctic Ocean from being an Arctic waters, which is cold and fresh, to one that is now warm and salty and, and more well mixed. And what we found is if we look at where the changes in the sea ice have been happening in the Arctic Ocean in wintertime, it's all here in the Barents Sea sector. And this is just a snapshot from yesterday. So the, this little um, line there shows where the average extent would be at this time of year. Um, I could have shown what it looks like over like when we hit the maximum winter extent, which is usually in March. 
but the ice just isn't forming there anymore. And I think uh, the, the Barents Sea sector's already pretty much transitioned to a seasonally ice-covered um, part of the Arctic Ocean. There's no more summer ice in this region. It's been really far north, um, the ice edge, in the last few years. But this might start representing what we think of an irreversible change, because usually we think of sea ice loss in the Arctic Ocean as not irreversible. It's linked to warming from greenhouse gases, but it's not that if you stopped putting more CO2 in the atmosphere, we started cooling things down. Even if you lost all the summer sea ice, it would come back. But if we start actually changing the ocean characteristics and turning it into an Atlantic Ocean, that might make it more difficult for the sea ice to come back. So I think these studies that have been documenting this and explaining it um, are shedding new light. And it has a lot of implications because this is a big area for fisheries. There's a lot of ecosystems here. There was another paper in JRL this year that was looking at phytoplankton bloom and how it's progressing further north at about a degree um, per year up in this region, especially we have these positive anomalies in phytoplankton blooms. Um, this is also the region of the Arctic when we think about mid-latitude linkages. There's been several studies published over the last several years that have looked at how the warming in this region and the lack of sea ice in this region feeds back into mid-latitude weather extremes and in particular the polar vortex. So this is a region that has a huge implications not just for what's going on in the Arctic but also the planet as a whole. Another study that I found really interesting, and this is getting way outside my area of expertise, but it's interesting that in the Arctic there's a lot of mercury contamination. So the Inuit women, for example, are told not to breastfeed their children because they have very high mercury levels in their breast milk. And this is because there's very large concentrations of mercury in the seals, in the fish, in the polar bears. And one thing that's puzzled scientists, though, is why are the mercury levels higher in the western Canadian Arctic than they are in the eastern Canadian Arctic? So the, the yellow here, this is for polar bear mercury concentrations. This is seals, and these are some... Um, I guess like more at the bottom of the food chain, like phytoplankton. I won't try to say their names because I won't say it correctly. But we can see that there's higher concentrations of mercury in these species in the western Canadian Arctic than in the eastern part. And scientists had always thought, well, this is probably related to increased transport of mercury from Asia over in this sector of the Arctic, or increased river discharge, which brings mercury, or more permafrost thaw, and that that's why the concentrations were higher in the biota in um, the western part of the Canadian Arctic. And in reality, this is now a profile. This is with depth in the ocean. This is total mercury concentration in the ocean. And when you look at the mercury concentration, it's actually higher, the total mercury concentration, in the eastern part of the, of the, the water here than it is over in the western part. So, that was a bit confusing, so you see these higher concentrations of total mercury. But what this study by Wang et al. Um, found was that this organic total mercury is actually converted into methylmercury, and that sits at a very shallow level here, and it's very highly concentrated over in the western Canadian Arctic. And so because it is at this shallow level, this is where a lot of the zooplankton and phytoplankton activity happens. There's also cod that sit at about this depth as well. And so these um, species are consuming this methylmercury, and that is leading to um, the increase in the mercury concentrations that they're finding in the species like polar bears and seals. And kind of keeping up with the, with the mercury um, theme, in part because we know this is an important neurotoxin, so we, we want to understand better how mercury concentrations are going to change in the Arctic. There's also the issue of the fact that the permafrost stores quite a bit of mercury. And there was a new study that was published in GRL this year that took a bunch of cores um, around different regions of the Arctic to try to estimate how much mercury is contained in the frozen permafrost um, within the Arctic. And they estimated, and there, there is a lot of uncertainty. I will say that their, their plus or minus is all, are about half of what the concentrations are that they're estimating. But they were estimating about 32 million gallons of mercury is trapped in the permafrost which is actually twice as much mercury as all the rest of the soils, the ocean, and the atmosphere combined. So there's a huge amount of mercury stored in the permafrost, but there's a lot of spatial variability, with, depending on sedimentation rates, also proximity to mercury sources and um, river discharges. But um, they, they also broke it down as a function of depth, so the first um, 30 centimeters of the soil, um, then sort of the active layer depth down to 100 centimeters and also down to 30 centimeters, and then just the whole total amount of um, mercury stored in the permafrost. And you see there's actually a huge concentration, if we look at the total amount stored in permafrost, definitely on the Siberian side of the Arctic. And a paper just came out 
like two days ago, because I get these alerts, um, just sort of general Arctic alerts. And there was another study that just was anticipating um, a huge release of mercury um, in the future as the permafrost continues to thaw. And it was about 9% of the global mercury, I think, is what they, they estimated. I didn't read it in detail since I didn't have time, but. And then, again, I, I thought, this is way, way outside my area of expertise, but I find it quite interesting because besides the fact that permafrost th stores mercury, it also stores a very large amount of carbon. In fact, there's more carbon, probably about twice as much carbon in the, in the permafrost than what's in the atmosphere today. But exactly how that carbon is going to be released has been very unclear. And the, th the thought is that it could be released either as CO2 or it could be released as methane, but that really depends on the microbial mo metabolism of carbon. And so this study, and this was published in Nature, was actually trying to sequence um, genomes using metagenomic sequencing, and they got like over 1,500 genomes to try to better understand the metabolic uptake of carbon from these different um, microorganisms in the soil that's frozen. And this is really important because I think improving our understanding of, it, of exactly how that carbon is going to be released is very important to parameterize in our climate models as we go into the future and we're looking at warming and permafrost degradation. And of course, you know, if it gets released as methane, it's much more potent than CO2. It has a larger warming effect, but it also is shorter lived in the atmosphere where CO2 is much longer lived. So exactly how this is going to partition will really dictate how quickly the Arctic is going to warm. I mean, when we're looking at future projections right now for Arctic warming, we're looking at warming um, in the autumn and winters of about seven degrees Celsius compared to today. So it's, it's a huge amount of warming, and that's going to impact all of this um, permafrost and this microbial activity. And then finally, I just thought I would um, touch on um, just a quick comment because IPCC had their um, report that came out on 1.5 degrees um, and compared to the two degree warming scenarios. And they had a statement in there saying that there's high confidence that the probability of a sea ice free Arctic Ocean during summer is substantially lower at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming compared to a two degrees warming. And that with 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, we may expect summer ice-free conditions to happen once per century. And with two degrees, it might happen once per decade. Um, the other important thing maybe to note is that this temperature overshoot, it is irreversible. So we do think that it's not an irreversible process, that the sea ice can come back, because there is a lot of interannual variability. And several studies came out this year talking about how much of the, the sea ice variability is caused by internal climate variability versus anthropogenic changes. Um, we, we think about a million square kilometers from year to year variability is just due to natural climate variability. So it's not necessarily going to happen that it will always be ice free. But I was involved in a couple studies, so I'm not trying to do self-promotion, but I like the figure that we made, and we have a figure like this that shows you know, what the Arctic sea ice will look like under different warming. So today we're here. This is the 1.5 um, degree warming. And we're starting to just border on when we start seeing ice-free conditions emerging in September. But by two degrees, we're already going to be ice-free in August and September. And so I think this IPC statement is actually a little bit conservative um, with what we know to be happening in the observations. It's mostly based on climate models, but the climate models are not as sensitive to the um, external forcing as what we're finding in the observations. So we were estimating in the, the Knotts and Struva study that with another 1.7 plus or minus about 0.2 degrees Celsius, we should see ice-free conditions in August and September. Or we can also translate in that into gigatons of carbon, which is about 800 extra gigatons of carbon plus or minus 300, and we'll start seeing um, ice-free conditions again in, in August and September. And it's not just that it's, we're looking at one month in the summer, but we can extend that out into the future under different warming scenarios and how many months of the Arctic Ocean will become ice-free. And then finally, I thought there's a few interesting things that we should look forward to for next year. And there were, excuse me, sessions here at AGU, of course, on ISAT-2, which was launched by NASA. Scientists should start having access to this data um, sometime later this spring which is exciting because we haven't had the ability to do, for example, sea ice thickness during summer, because right now we're relying on Cryosat-2, which is a radar altimeter. It doesn't really work in summer when it's melting. But ISAT-2, on the other hand, we should be able to um, better estimate sea ice thickness, for example, during summertime, which we currently don't have estimates of. Of course, it's also used for um, looking at how um, Places like Greenland and Antarctica are changing and other glaciers. It's also used for height to vegetation studies. So 
Um, I think scientists are very excited to start getting their hands on the ISAT-2 data, and hopefully it'll work a lot better than ISAT-1, which had some problems with the laser, so we didn't get that much data. The other exciting thing, I think, in Arctic science is the fact that um, the German ship Polar Storm will be frozen into the ice starting in September 2019, and then it will drift with the pack ice, hopefully for a year, and stay within the Arctic Ocean. And there's a whole range of different science objectives with this platform. So you have about 17 different nations that are participating. Um, and it'll be studies from you know, atmosphere, ocean, um, sea ice interactions, looking at biology, looking at atmospheric processes and chemistry. So it's a really unique opportunity for scientists to come together and not just collect their data, but also work together to try to advance our understanding of Arctic um, ocean changes. Thank you. <coughs> um, yep. Yeah, uh, one question. Oh, uh, oh we'll take two. <laughs> Adina. <laughs> Did they indicate why the permafrost has so much or soil has so much Right. I mean, part of it was sedimentation rates, I guess, that control the mercury deposition. And I don't know enough about um, this. And they were looking at um, organic soil carbon and its ratios with mercury and I think a lot of it does, some of it does come from emissions, but some of it's just also atmospheric processes that has a seasonal cycle in the mercury deposition. And different regions have different amounts. And I think part of the difference, I think, between Siberia and Alaska side had to do with sedimentation rates, which is a little bit outside my area of expertise, so I have to admit I don't know enough about it. And you had one? It's a laser altimeter, yeah. So this will be a green laser, whereas ISAT-1 was a red laser. Right. Yeah. So are there plans to use the data studies I, I guess I don't know if they're specifically focusing that within the science team, to be completely honest. But I mean, I suppose they could also be. But I mean, the main target is ice mass changes. I mean, that is, that's the overall goal of, of ISAT-2. The one thing that I think is exciting for scientists is that it, with Cryosat 2 still in operation and then ISAT 2, we would actually able to finally ma map snow depth on sea ice if we assume that the radar is coming from the snow ice interface and that the LIDAR is coming from the top of the snowpack. And this is something we don't know anything about because we can't really detect snow on sea ice with um, current satellite methods. So I think this is a unique new opportunity for us. So I, th I think the data will be publicly available. So if you wanted to play with it, it will, but not like Once they've calibrated it or something. <laughs> yeah. Our next speaker is Xiaoping Shen, and uh, he's uh, representing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Water resources. Water resources research. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, I guess similar to some of the earlier speakers, I wouldn't have very many studies coming out of water resources research. Uh, I was tasked with giving an overview of the de progress of deep learning in geosciences. And to do that, I find it imperative to talk about the, the talks and, 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 and posters in this AGU because the, the development in this field is so fast that if, if, we, if I just summarize the papers that have been published, I mean, they they almost become obsolete when they were published uh, because this field develops very fast and there's so many exciting progress. So I reviewed both uh, papers and, and uh, posters and, pre and presentations. Uh, all right, so just in, uh, to give you a 30,000 feet uh, overview, in, in 2016 we have 18 submissions in the AGU about deep learning. Uh, in 2017, 58 and there's 168 this year. As you can see, there's a triple submission year over year, and I, I kind of looked at how it maps onto the development of deep learning in computer science. We noticed there's three years, 2012, 2013, and 14 to 15, where there have been three years of continuous triple over year uh, growth. So, and then uh, the, the growth becomes uh, uh, two times, double and then 70% growth. So I think we're still looking at an early exponential growth stage and I expect there to be, a, if this comparison is any, any way uh, useful, I, I, think, I think we're still looking at a significant amount of growth. And I'll give you a kind of a breakdown 
of the uh, submissions to this AGU. It looks like uh, hydrology folks uh, and uh, astrophysics a little bit faster, but uh, I think um, uh, maybe that's also due to the number of submissions, basically. Uh, then uh, when I look at the agency investments, we can already see this. Uh, I, I guess a lot of you have uh, attended Mr. Pra uh, Prabha's talk. Uh, that is an invest significant investment in the Department of Energy. And there have also been significant, uh, significant investment from NASA, from NOAA. So all of a sudden, we find that the agencies have already invested uh, substantially in developing some of the infrastructure uh, in terms of data ca capability and scaling the deep learning capability. So when we started our new deep learning research, it's, it would be beneficial to look at existing infrastructure, uh, especially for at scale. Um, so what can deep learning do? Uh, I think the sentiment also changed from the crowd changing from what in the world is deep learning to maybe I want to do that too. So, so let me explain a little bit about what deep learning do. And the, the first layer of application would be just uh, playing a simple data. Um, that is the uh, original application of deep learning in visual recognition. And for example, you have an image, you want to classify that image, you find a, find a localization, you localize where the features are, then object detection, detect different, uh, different objects in an image, and then segmentation, just say that that portion of the image is a dog and uh, that portion is a cat, although I don't think they normally live together. Um, but so they applied the same kind of technique for uh, uh, so Kashnas, this is work out of the Berkeley lab. Uh, they applied the same kind of technique and uh, did uh, feature recognition out of their atmospheric simulation as real, as, as real data. So they can recognize extreme events, including hurricanes, atmospheric rivers, and frontal uh, events uh, from, from these systems, which would uh, greatly s reduce the, the labor to identify these uh, events. So this is straightforward application, although they, they brought it to a substantial scale, even bigger than what uh, some of the image recognition folks do. And then the second thing it does, it, uh, it can do dynamical predictions or forecast. Essentially, you have a dynamical model. Then you train it to another dynamical model or uh, a forced system, uh, kind of a, what they call synchronized the two, or you, the, you have the deep learning neural network to kind of mimic uh, the other system that you have data for. Uh, and this is some work out of Penn State uh, where you, we, we trained uh, soil moisture, uh, deep learning models to mimic soil moisture dynamics given the forcing data. And, and it turns out even with uh, three years of data, we can actually train a model that can extend many years back and give you the similar uh, multi-year trend. Uh, the third thing that people do with this is that we do uh, inversion. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the inversion consists of uh, you know, one thing to do work with posters and presentations is I don't have this many, very many beautiful pictures because uh, I, I, I got permission for some of them, but not all of them. Uh, so this one, I, I don't have a figure for. So inversion is you have a field, for example, conductivity field. Then you want to know what is, what is the average conductivity or effective conductivity from that field. And you want to invert some over large scale parameters out of that field. Uh, Previously, you have to solve very expensive systems, very expensive uh, inversion problems, but people have figured out that if you use deep learning, you can infer these uh, properties directly. And also, you can use to estimate parameters, and you can use it as an emulator of the system. This carries from the dynamical prediction part. You can use deep learning system to rep replace certain part of the very expensive numerical models um, that reduces your time. Uh, and what some people, uh, a lot of people may not be very familiar with is to use new, new, uh, deep learning models to generate scenarios. Um, this specifically refers to uh, generative advisorial network. So you can, what that does is that you, you two players play a game where you have an, uh, 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 an act, actor and a critic, they play this um, zero sum game. And uh, in the end, uh, we learned the background data distribution. So you, you can use that actor to con generate a lot of distribution from a sample from that posterior distribution. So that is very effective for uh, Bayesian uncertainty on quantification and various different purposes. And this is one example where you have uh, a channel geometry that was generated by GAN. So I'll come to this example a bit later. So what are the applications? We, we, we do find that the applications permeated into almost every aspect of geosciences. Um, for example, in climate modeling, in addition to extreme detection, uh, 
People have also done, uh, this is a work published in PNAS, where they use deep learning uh, models to uh, per, do this super parameterization. So this cloud super parameterization used to be very hard and is highly dependent on resolution. So it has been a significant bottleneck in climate modeling for a very long time. So the work that they, they've done is to train a deep, learning, a deep neural network over a high resolution simulation on an aquaclad planet. And then they directly uh, infer what the super parameters should be from that high resolution model. And uh, this uh, is a, a significant publication in the past year, I would say. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a series of posters and presentations where they talked about using deep learning networks, uh, neural networks to, for long range forecasting of sea surface temperature or hourly precipitation um, or weather predictions. The consistent theme among these, uh, these posters are that they can increase the predictive range of previous models. Uh, if your models used to be accurate for three days, they can probably add a, uh, increase that range to longer than that. And that showed, they showed uh, effective, uh, effectiveness beyond previously achievable results. Uh, then we come to hydrology, and there's a lot of applications in hydrology. The first, uh, first one is a straightforward one. Uh, uh, these folks, they showed, uh, this is from uh, Peking University, where they, uh, uh, actually, sorry, uh, Southern University of uh, uh, Science and Technology. They, they built a computer vision, computer vision model to model uh, rainfall runoff. But what is also interesting is that they showed these camera ring gauges, where you just take some, uh, sta some camera, take continuous videos, you can infer uh, rainfall intensities from those uh, videos. And it turns out the accuracy wasn't too bad. And this can completely change our understanding of available data. Uh, imagine everybody with a camera, if you take, a, take videos, can give you measurements of rainfall intensity, then your no available data sets could increase exponentially. Um, and s some of you might have driven cars that have these automatic sensing capability that uh, choose to change the wind wipers depending on what you see, perceives as the rainfall intensity. So this could potentially work and can, can change, dramatically change our available data. Uh, this is also another work that recognizes global reservoirs from Landsat images. Uh, what is interesting is they distinguished between reservoirs and natural lakes. In, in the end, uh, the neural network learned to distinguish that. It learned to capture features such as dams that sits across this uh, sits across these reservoirs, but are missing from the lakes. And they can the, the networks learn to know that these features are important. And uh, the such database was not available before for uh, many different countries. Uh, and uh, there's also work uh, that looks at soil moisture modeling uh, that, uh, uh, that were able to distinguish between different sources of uncertainties in uh, soil, uh, deep learning soil moisture modeling by learning from satellite uh, soil moisture data. Um, and th there's also other work, i come come to them later. Uh, so there's also hazard forecast that um, I think this was invested by NOAA that people have been doing, uh, been uh, piling together different data sets, and they've been training uh, various different machine learning algorithms, algorithms, including deep learning algorithms, to uh, forecast disasters including lightning, hail, and uh, uh, tornadoes. Uh, they're, uh, they've been showing some uh, preliminary successes in these uh, projects. And from biogeosciences, I've been able to find uh, people are using uh, deep learning for identification of different tree species, different land cover at, but ha at a much higher resolution than before. And some more interesting applications is about the crop yields because you get, if you monitor different parts of the, uh, different, uh, the, the, the crop at different times of the year, you can probably tell how, how well that gro crop grow. And by doing that, you can probably tell uh, what kind of crop yield you're gonna get. So that's one step uh, beyond what we can previously achieve. And we, I also find lots of applications in space weathers, like solar winged, uh, but I'm not an expert in these uh, at all, so I cannot summarize these studies. Uh, we, we see some interesting applications that just started to emerge. I remember there were not such, such applications last year. About uh, on, on, in Earth's surface, we have applications that look at bathymetry and, and shoreline generations and fluvial patterns, for, uh, and and subsurface uh, sub, subsurface data. 
For example, this work uh, from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, they used the conditional uh, uh, gener generative uh, adversarial network, conditional GAN, to, to uh, learn the probability from training images and they can generate a lot of images that allow them to estimate the uncertainties uh, and uh, parameters from their field uh, directly, so train another model to, to learn those parameters directly. So that's a massive speed up from previous practice. Uh, this is the work that uh, Nesvel does from fluvial geology, uh, for, uh, fluvial geomorphology. So what they did is they trained these uh, GANs from many different satellite images and they, these GANs eventually learned to craft these uh, meandering channel patterns and they're highly realistic. Uh, the results are very promising. Uh, uh, and I've also seen from ge geomorphology that you have new, parameters, new parameterization schemes for, for wave run-up from Gaussian process model. This is Gaussian process model. And then for littoral systems identification along the coastal systems. They can identify different, whether it's uh, coastal wetlands or uh, different, different uh, types of systems. And then uh, they use, people have built deep learning neural networks to predict how shoreline would evolve given different uh, uh, impacts from the ocean. Uh, one thing, that, one uh, work, piece of work that I find to be very interesting is the prediction of uh, chaos. Uh, people have trained uh, deep neural network to predict how chaos evolve. And this uh, I, relates me to one of the work I see in physics where people trained neural networks to predict how chaos evolve and they can be successful over eight Lyapunov times, which previously was, was thought to be impossible. So there's a lot of potential and uh, we're not, we, we do not know where the limit is uh, for the moment how, about how much these networks can, can emulate these, uh, chaos, chaotic systems. So there are some emerging trends out of this. Um, one thing that, that we as a group kind of published is that uh, there is a new data-driven avenue where we have the data. And the data, give, we can train deep learning models out of this. Then we can use some interpretive methods to know what the deep learning models have learned and generating competing hypotheses from these models. And then we can use other sorts, sorts of tools to verify these hypotheses. This, this is a much more efficient way of, of uh, examining data instead of uh, the data-centric uh, Bayesian models where you run a bunch of runs and examine the posterior, and that's much more extensive, expensive. Uh, so what is important in this is the, our ability to interpret what the deep learning models did. This is an interesting work in rainfall runoff modeling. Basically, it's uh, Kratz, uh, Kratz, sorry, I missed his name here, Kratz. Kratzert, uh, they trained a rainfall runoff model where they, uh, they have basically have rings and they, they predict what the stream flow is. They trained over hundreds of basins over continental United States. What, and he visualized one of the internal states of the, of the neural network. What he showed is that uh, even if the network did not know about snow at all, some of the cells automatically was trained to, to represent snow and it compares fairly well with uh, the snow, actual snow measurements. Uh, it means this network has its perception of what should be done, how this system works. Uh, so I ask him, okay, you, you tell me something I knew, but how do we interpret those states and cells that we do not know? We do not know what the, the, the cells are doing. Can we interpret what this, how the system was built and, and get, get us some better, under, improved understanding of how the system works? And so this, this increased uh, trends focus on integrating physics with machine learning. Uh, for example, in this work from Brahas Solano, what they did is they waved these physical equations into their neural network or uh, their deep learning systems, uh, basically a, via, go, go, via some uh, parameterized uh, priors. And then they are able to kind of learn not only the parameters, but also the constitutional relations uh, from data. Uh, then we have uh, Jordan Reed who presented a nice work, a modeling of water temperature, and they uh, respected the, the basic law of uh, energy balance. They, 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 in, they, they kind of forced that into the neural network and, uh, and uh, by, by changing the loss, loss function. Therefore, the, 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 the result that they found is that they can, their, their network can generalize better into the future when you enforce such physical laws.
and there's a focus on uncertainty quantification. Uh, for, for, for example, for example, Zabras's work, um, they used a convolutional decoder, de encoder decoder work that uh, trained a dynamic model and um, uh, repeatedly to measure the uncertainty that comes with uh, the heterogeneous subsurface media. This is another work out of Penn State, uh, this is one of the last things now, uh, that uh, we, l we examined how a soil moisture, if we have a predictive model and we, we predict some errors, uh, the uncertainty estimate can actually predict the actual error pretty well. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and we can separate them into different sources of errors. And the nice thing about this is you do not, you do not have to specify an error model. You don't have to specify this autocorrelation. You don't have to specify what caused the error. You can let the net network f figure out that error for you. It can build an error model for you. And that tells us where we, we would have a bigger errors. Um, so, that some, some of my last thoughts, there are some potential issues. One is uh, we have many, many applications, but the, there are very poor controls of uh, reproducibility and comparability, and there's no standards, and there's no competitions as the AI communities do. So, and uh, also, there doesn't seem to be an organization that uh, get people together to talk about uh, in progress in informatics and deep learning. So I was wondering if there would be opportunities to, uh, for some of uh, more organized events like a competitions to uh, bring us as a community. That's it. I hope I didn't take too much Thank time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Question? One? Jason? I think that's an excellent point, and this is what I mentioned here. This is, I mean, agree with you uh, that we need a, a more concerted effort to pulling together the data we have. We might have a better opportunity now that we've learned experiences from other domains that we could have put together either competitions or some other big data sets that we could uh, put together and leverage some of the infrastructure investment that have been, done, have been made mm -hmm. uh, to to do things together in a more effective manner. Mm -hmm. Effective co community competitions are highly effective, highly efficient because they, uh, one group probably prepares the data and then everybody can work with that data. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's highly efficient uh, a way of using capital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. We gotta move on. Um, so our last talk is by Dolores Knipp, uh, who um, is, uh, uh, space weather. So space weather, what the heck is that? It is, first of all, one of the newest journals in AGU. We've been in existence for about a solar cycle, I think in those terms. So a little over, uh, about 15 years. But uh, it's probably a new term to many of you, and I thought I would take this opportunity to not only do a review of uh, sort of the greatest hits of this uh, past, uh, past year, but also the greatest graphics, because um, graphics is kind of a challenge for space weather. Space weather is kind of an invisible science, except for sunspots, which you see a few of here on this uh, graphic, and, uh, and for the aurora. So I'm going to spend a little time on the both, both of those. Um, this graphic was generated as a result of a story that went out from uh, our journal a little earlier this year about a very big space weather event. So let me tell you by comparison and contrast about weather and space weather. So weather is what happens when the sun reaches out 
and touches our atmosphere via its thermal processes and thermal emissions. And it does that, and it's that output from the sun is amazingly constant to within one-tenth of one percent over decades. But the sun has a magnetic side to it, and that is its sort of evil twin side. And it is a side uh, which is very impulsive, very episodic, and it is the sun's magnetic side that tends to churn up its energy, turn it into little magnetic knots, which are visible to us as sunspots, and then throw that energy out into uh, interplanetary space, perhaps towards Earth, in this amazing mess called the solar wind and coronal mass ejections, solar flares, solar energetic particles, all kinds of fancy names for basically saying the sun is reaching out to our geospace and sometimes all the way down to the ground, uh, sometimes all the way down into the sea to interact not only with our atmosphere, upper atmosphere, but more importantly, with our technologies. And since it is a technology-driven issue, it is a relatively new um, form of science because technology is a relatively new aspect of uh, human interaction. So what you see here is the sun. It looks like something I drew when I was a kid and actually still draw. You see these, these something coming out from the uh, from the sun, this is actually the sun's atmosphere. We live in the sun's atmosphere, and it is uh, free-flowing, but full of transients, and it is the transients that are usually of most interest. And then over on the right-hand side, you're seeing um, the Earth and its magnetic protective cover, and you really don't get to see uh, the Earth's atmosphere, but those colored ribbons are part of the particles the uh, charged particles in the geospace environment that can come crashing down into our atmosphere and create the beautiful aurora. So kind of a long introduction. So let's think about the aurora and the first, uh, and the first um, event that we call space weather. It is an event called the Carrington Storm in 1859 and it was an interaction with a very fast ejection from the sun that compressed our magnetic field, produced aurora all the way down to almost the equator. This is a very new image pulled out of the archives from a paper just published in um, Applied, uh, Applied Physics by uh, Hisashi Hayakawa et al. And what we are doing is we are starting to discover our history in space weather. So this is one of the few images or paintings of an aurora that I am aware of. It is made um, from Melbourne, Australia, which is actually mid-latitudes. So these aurora we're showing as great arcs at mid-latitudes. And this is sort of our baseline storm. What we know happened in the northern hemisphere were currents that ran through the internet of the time, which is a telegraph system, and some locations that were hubs for telegraphs were seeing so much current flowing through their systems that they actually caught on fire. Mm -hmm. So that you can imagine that we really do not want things like that happening in current day systems that are very delicate electronics. So this is our kind of first view, and I'm, I'm going to use it as a baseline because for the longest time we thought that this was the first space weather storm, but not quite so fast. One of the things that, another, that a colleague of mine has found um, is that there was a Carrington storm before the Carrington storm. Now, why would I give the storm a name? It is because the first observation of a great solar flare that at least was recorded was done so by Richard Carrington in 1859. He was actually observing these knots of magnetism and saw a huge conflagration in one of these events and noticed that about 19 hours later, amazing things were happening, including aurora to low latitudes and uh, all of the problems with technology. 
Shall I call this a Carrington storm before the Carrington storm? We've thought that Carrington storms only maybe happened once every 150 years, but going back into the archives now, Space Weather and, and Associated Journals are showing, oh, there was a big event in 1770. It's the first aurora recorded in both hemispheres and near the equator. It comes out as a fiery light like vermilion sand in the north with something of a golden color rising up inside of the polar star. It was a worldwide event uh, with uh, paintings being done by our uh, colleagues in Japan. And this is the incredible red aurora in Japan in 1770. What follows on with that, also very recently published, is a picture that absolutely fascinates me. This is the same red aurora, a different uh, perspective, but what you're seeing over here in the middle, kind of lower right, there's a little figure down there, appears to be standing in a stream, and I, I thought, what is he doing? He is pulling buckets of water out of the stream. Those buckets of water are being lifted up into the thatched roofs because these people believe that a firestorm is imminent. It is going to be coming over the hills at any minute, but in fact it was the red aurora, but they at that latitude had no history of seeing red aurora, uh, and, and so they were preparing for Armageddon. So we are starting to build up our history of space weather, uh, and this is one example. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go forward with some work that I was doing a little bit earlier this year. We have found out that there was a similar extreme eruption that has flown under the radar, extreme event that propagated to Earth in 4 August 1972. It arrived, it got from the sun to the Earth in less than 15 hours, which is a record. And uh, we've somehow uh, regressed and only able to show this work in black and white because that's the way the images were made, but at least we were imaging the sun. And now you can see this knot of magnetism. It spewed out materials that actually interrupted, interacted with our uh, newly developing uh, space systems. Spacecraft missions actually stopped operating within about 30 to 60 days because their solar panels had taken on so much radiation. It destabilized the power system in North America. That was known, but the impact of that was not fully understood until we saw other things going on. And the magnetic perturbations when the sun reached out with those magnetic knots and crushed the Earth's magnetosphere um, resulted in the unintended detonations of sea mines in Southeast Asia, 4,000 of them. They all had to be replaced. And that was in the Vietnam War uh, when we were very actively uh, trying to bring hostilities to an end by uh, limiting war supplies. And let's go. So let's come to something a little more recent. Uh, we had an event, it wasn't quite as great, but it was one that was very well uh, viewed uh, with all kinds of space and ground detectors. Last, uh, not last September, but a year ago, September, we had the largest flare of the solar cycle occurring in a place that was very well aligned uh, with Earth. As a result, the aurora, so now we're getting better pictures, we're looking down on the aurora over New Zealand. Uh, that created an interaction with the power grid in New Zealand. Power transformers, uh, because of the currents that were extra currents flowing in the transformers, actually started to sing in very low frequency radio emissions. And so radio detectors at some distance from these um, uh, subgrid, uh, substations were, were hearing sort of the groaning of these transformers as they tried to get back to, uh, to normalcy. That is not a good thing to have transformers groaning and transformers heating. It means that you are likely to suffer a failure if you don't take control of the system. Um, that event is also important because it is the first event where we were able to see these solar energetic particles that come screaming out in advance of these uh, slower traveling coronal ejections. 
they interact with Earth's and now we know Mars, upper atmosphere, nuclear reactions are taking place with these very fast particles. And this was the first event where we had dual, simultaneously measurements of solar energetic particles reaching into Mars atmosphere, creating nuclear interactions seen at Mars surface and at Earth's surface. Now I will go to something, I've gone from the wild, now a couple slides on the mild. Space weather and citizen scientists. Because space weather is becoming a topic that is a little bit more popular, slightly better understood, we have people, especially in the northern and extreme southern climes, uh, going out and looking for aurora. And one of the things that happened with a citizen scientist eff effort that was reported uh, here earlier this week is that a new type of emission has been found over we knew it was there, but nobody knew that it was special. But we see these great, long, purple-blue streaks from time to time. You'll see them very often in locations like uh, Calgary. And we are just by getting various people, scientists and citizen scientists, to take pictures, bring them all together in a not quite machine learning environment, but at least to consolidate their data, we are realizing that there are forms of emission in our atmosphere that are associated with mild types of storms that we had not even known about. And there was a big question, what do we call this? We didn't have a name for it. Lots of going back and forth between the scientists and the citizen scientists. And they finally, they, they had their technical names and they couldn't agree on what to call it, so they decided to call it Steve. <laughs> and while well, you go, Steve, what is that? I kept hearing about it, I go, what is Steve? So finally, with a lot of scientific effort, we figured out what it was. It's very fast, narrow flows of uh, particles in the upper atmosphere. And at last AGU, after the description was presented, one of the scientists came up and said, well, that is a strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. It's Steve. <laughs> so, so Steve got a name and a meaning uh, at AGU last year, as I understand it. So pretty topical. Finally, what's coming? Just launched, launched earlier this year, our first effort at viewing space weather from geosynchronous orbit. We view terrestrial weather from geosynchronous orbit all the time, but now we have a spacecraft uh, uh, instruments up on a, uh, a mission of opportunity. It is looking at our Earth in the ultraviolet, with an ultraviolet spectrograph. On the right, you are seeing the sunlit side of the atmosphere that has atomic oxygen that is emitting at 135 nanometers. That's ultraviolet. The orange region there, that's our very thin protective layer that we call our atmosphere. And that's all the way up to our upper atmosphere. The lower atmosphere, the 15 kilometers, isn't even thick enough to show up on this. But we are going to be able to look at the limb, which is the orange part, and the disk, and do this on a repetitive, ongoing basis. We'll even get to see over on the left side, there's an extension. That is the aurora. So the aurora also glows in atomic oxygen. So we're going to be able to monitor the aurora, kind of big scale, in the southern and northern hemispheres simultaneously at night, and then see what the reaction is to our, of our upper atmosphere to driving uh, by the solar wind and solar activity. So I think next uh, year we will be reporting many important new views of the sun uh, and, and Earth's response um, not only to the episodic drivers, but to the things that we think are normal. We're going to have so much imagery that I'm sure deep learning is going to be required to help us uh, sort it out. Uh, so it's an exciting time for uh, this new or old science, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dolores. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Okay. So I'm a paleomagnetist, and paleomagnetists always start their talks by saying that the field is dropping, and therefore uh, sunspot, you know, solar wind is going to uh, destroy our grid, and we need to understand the magnetic field because of this. But then talking to you guys, 
I think is more complicated than that. <laughs> and I was just wondering what your view is yeah. on what happens when the field uh, decays. Uh, so there, is some, there is some modeling going on to uh, try to understand if we, if we have a, a weaker field, how much our protective covering would be sort of uh, hit, it, how would it vibrate, how would it uh, interact, but I, I don't know that I can quite say that, oh, we have to worry about the field decaying and our power grids being uh, at, uh, at risk because the uh, frequency with which things are happening on the sun are probably high enough to to uh, give us more concern with just the current state mm -hmm. of the magnetism. But the one thing I think that is kind of interesting to um, consider is that as we lose or reduce that protective magnetic covering, uh, the galactic cosmic rays, which are zinging through us, or at least their daughter particles are zinging through us here in this room, are there going to be more of them? Mm -hmm. And so there has been a lot of debate about does that mean um, Faster change, faster evolution. Um, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, more to come. So I think being a, a kind of a new science, we can make a lot of conjecture, but I don't think we have a lot of answers. Okay. Well, good. So we don't have to buy tin foil hats yet. Um. <laughs> oh, uh, nobody knows. It's called chaos, and, you know, it's going down. And it goes down, it goes up. It goes down and it goes up on its own time scale, yeah. and so we every try to. So five hundred thousand years is a. Not regularly. Not regularly. You know, there were like forty million years with no reversals at all, and. And right now we're in a reversal. Mm, that's mm. debatable. We're in a decline. I say not, but some other people say yes, and I made a bet it will not reverse in the next five hundred years. But you know, how am I going to collect? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of debate. We, we don't know. I mean, it, it's generated. Never mind. That's not space weather. So yeah. there, There's <laughs> an aspect of that, though, in that there is a particular weakness in a region called the South Atlantic Anomaly, and that mm -hmm. South Atlantic Anomaly is growing. Mm -hmm. We know that it's growing because our spacecraft go through there, and there are some spacecraft with sensitive instruments that actually have to shut down mm -hmm. when they go through that region. So mm -hmm. yeah, And that's problems. growing. Yeah, that's growing. <laughs> Okay, cool. Any other questions for Dolores before he scoots off? Okay. Now you had one question for um, was that you for some somebody that I, I cut you off because I was trying to get through. Uh, did you want to ask your question? Y yeah, you. Yeah, Xiao Xiaoping. Oh, did he scoot out? Oh, okay. Because I. I I think we have the room until uh, another uh, few minutes, so we can have one more question. Uh, I was just wondering if you came across any studies where machine learning was used to uh, use neural modeling. What I mean by that is, uh, let's say, you have a physical model, and it's probably not going to agree with your observations. Oh, so this error in the yeah. machine learning tool, yeah. and then um, kind of like. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I want to thank all you editors, although I know it took a lot of effort and you were asked at the last minute to do this. Um, not my fault. <laughs> and um, I'm, uh, I'm, I really appreciate it and thank you so much for your efforts and thanks for coming. Uh, I think we'll do this again next year, hope so. And uh, thank you for coming.